let us start this lecture with a thought process by Gautam Buddha. Little by little a person becomes evil as a water pot is filled by drops of water. Little by little a person becomes good as a water pot is filled by drops of water. In the last lecture, we had initiated certain discussion on temple tank systems which ever were there in ancient India. If you look at temple plays a very important role in our life, particularly in ancient time, it was the center for propagation of education, heritage, culture and also the technology to larger extent which controls the life of common human being. And therefore, the uh, temples were having uh, water tanks which were not being used for everyday uses, rather it uh, being utilized for vital purposes for recharging the underground aquifers, reducing the runoff, enhancing the water stagnation time, thus ensuring sufficient water in the domestic wells during the summer months. Let us uh, look at one example where we will see that lot of water bodies around a temple that is Jagannath temple uh, in Puri of Odisha. This is the beautiful uh, temple I have shown here, but if you look at uh, we are discussing not about the temple structure, rather about the water bodies around this temple. The one uh, tank which is known as Narendra Sarovar was uh, constructed basically uh, during the this temple construction, but however, the history says that uh, this pond was created during 13th century by Narendra Mahapatra, the minister of Kavi Narashima Deva in 13th century at a distance around 1 kilometer on the north side of Sri Jagannath temple and this size is 873 feet long and 743 wide, it is a quite a huge uh, tank. I have shown here in these pictures which you can see that the center of this huge server or what we call in English pond, it is having a small temple also and which is having uh, the utility maybe for the architectural beauty one is, but other things it would be uh, that it will be acting as a the measure of water in the tank. Beside this, not in this sarovar or the pond, but in other uh, places uh, some step well are being used to recharge the water inside. And here very interesting thing, if you look at this is the bridge which is there for people to move around and this is uh, the corbellal uh, system is being used, if you look at and that similar structures are there in the various other bridges which were being built in ancient time. Beside this, there are several other water tanks like Indradumna tank is located near Gundicha temple which is around 3 kilometer from the Jagannath temple and Rohini Kunda is a sacred well located within the Jagannath temple premise and uh, the Markandra tank is around 4 acre in size in the Markandeswar temple uh, which is located southwest of the Jagannath Mandir in Markandeswar Sai area and uh, Sweta Ganga tank is located to the south of the temple and these are the tanks which are existing, but there might be several other tanks which are not associated the, with the temple, but will be around. Some of them might be acquired by the people because today there is a maniac for grabbing the land across the country. Let us look at actually a research work is being done by CPR Environmental Education Center Chennai, who took up survey of something 175 temple tanks in the South India and they have also made a very nice map here which you can see. But their work was mainly concentrated on the southern side, particularly Tamil Nadu where you can see 116 uh, water bodies associated with the temples, you know they could locate at you know few years back. And beside this of course, Andhra, Karnataka and then Kerala they have, but in other places the numbers are very meager, it cannot be according to me 
the numbers will be much higher so far the sacred water bodies are concerned and we need to do research on this and let me just tell you give some data from them the Tamil Nadu the 39 temples tanks were with the area from 0.25 to 3 hectares it's very huge these temple tanks were revered no less than the temple itself that means you know they consider this as a as divine as the temple that much much of importance were given to the water bodies at that time of course not today uh, because we are using the water from the in a pipe and supplied by the government or local bodies and we are not careful about the water uses and it's you know considering it as a divine some of these sacred tanks supported a variety of life forms which helped to maintain the cleanliness of the tank in the natural way but in modern time we are using mechanical way we will be putting some kind of a, you know water purification systems which is are in the market but their nature does the purification that is the thing we need to learn so that we need not to pay money to the people and which is unnatural lot of chemicals are entering in the process of purification of water into our body and it is spoiling also but unfortunately this system which were there in the ancient india and uh, associated with the uh, temple uh, and other uh, sacred structures those are uh, being declined and deteriorated over the years and uh, because of that uh, most of the ancient temple tanks have fallen to state of repair and disuse because most of the technologies in ancient india needs the regular uh, maintenance which we didn't do unchecked extraction has led to the dying of some of the temple tanks because people were using sparingly the water but today people use is profusely right they don't have concern for that and pressure on the land which i had told earlier that today people want to grab the land and have led to the encroachment of these dried out tanks and not only the sacred tank also the other tanks which are being used uh, secular tanks which are being used earlier by the people are being taken over by the builders and then other people and many tanks have become sinks for the sewage and the garbage of the neighborhood now you know like water system is fall apart if you look at the water system is basically in the turmoil today uh, whatever we are existing in the ancient india and uh, let us now talk about irrigation system in ancient india a question might be coming to your mind what do you mean by irrigation why is irrigation required and was irrigation system present in any ancient india if you look at irrigation is basically method of supplying water to the field for growth of crops because crops you know is very important for the life and i consider that it is the primary wealth right agriculture is the primary wealth or the crops are the primary wealth of uh, us and the rest of the earth are secondary wealth but unfortunately the entire world including india is running after secondary wealth but still india is considered as the agriculture country since time immemorial and also will remain for years to come because india is a populous country and food is essential as our scripture says anna patishta deva that means without food you cannot really do anything so therefore we need to uh, produce food and for that irrigation is essential keep in mind that according to krishna swami india was the international producer in prehistoric age unfortunately today also we are producing but using chemical fertilizers and other things but we need to go back to the uh, our natural way of farming which i had discussed earlier for that irrigation is very important and essential when rainfall is not sufficient or occurs in the wrong season because you know like there is a climate change therefore the uh, rainfall is very very erratic and we need to now learn how to face the challenges created by the climate change and global warming and uh, by use of irrigation system in ancient india and also we can improvise it we can have at least two crops in a year to meet the demand of the food in this country uh, the irrigation system can be divided broadly into two categories one is natural 
other is artificial natural means basically the with the help of rivers springs lakes lakes means natural lakes and rain waters and others artificial means uh, we'll have to use tanks uh, pools and then wells embankments dams extra so that we can uh, you know store the water uh, rain water and also the flowing water so that we can utilize for the irrigation so uh, let us look at historical perspective of irrigation system and if you go back to the indus valley civilization to the uh, Mahanjadar and Harappan sites, you will find that uh, also the evidence of the food grains like wheat, barley and sesame, peas extra where some of the winter crops right, which uh, require irrigation to so help of bar barrages and canals. And uh, I remember that I had shown you that uh, people were having particularly in uh, you know Mahanjadar sites like you know there is a uh, way of uh, utilizing the uh, canals for the irrigation purposes and the excavation sites in Rajasthan desert indicates presence of irrigation canals. Seasonal damming rivers on the smaller branches helps in inundates the lands with the seals on a smaller river banks enhancing its fertility for agriculture. See in modern dams there is a problem always the silt is a big problem of getting you know deposited on the uh, dam itself or in the canal also to uh, blocking the portion. But earlier days um, uh, people were using these seals for the as a fertilizers in the land that by the method of inundation and uh, irrigation system which we will be discussing little bit later on. And the pottery specimen of deep groups and large number of wells found as Mahanjadar suggest possibility of raising water for irrigation purposes. During Vedic period, water was considered as auspicious and utmost important uh, component of uh, life. And according to uh, League weather, uh, the water sources can be classified as rain water, water by deing soils, water ooze from a spring and river and streams. So, if you look at it can be basically two types of irrigation systems what we had discussed earlier were known to the Vedic farmers that is the uh, natural and artificial. If you look at the water management at the Dola Vira, you can see that this is the remnants of a dam on one side there is a nalas means basically a canal you can say or a drain a canals. So, that uh, it is given some of these portions people are saying it was might be a dam kind of thing. And beside this people have conjectured also the how they could have, have a structure to strengthen the dams. They were thinking that palisade fences of the wood or metal stake these are the wood kind of things and vertic uh, horizontal and then these are vertical uh, being placed inside the soil. So, that it will give a, a structural support to take the water load due to the you know during the floods and other thing on the channels. So, these are the things people are thinking it might be having and let us look at some more historical perspective of irrigation system. In pre Mauryan period irrigation from water of river canals were used profusely and uh, construction of dam was considered as an act of auspicious and social duty. It is uh, even today also we feel that kind of social obligation particularly if you talk with the old people in villages, remote villages not modern villages right. You will find that it is very important to have wells to be dug by the people and that is the practice which we are having uh, earlier days. And even if you go to the Sabha Parva of Mahabharata, Narada is asking Yudhishthira are large tanks and lakes constructed all over the kingdom at proper distance without agriculture being in the dire realm of entirely dependent on showers and heavens. That means, if you go to the even the story of Mahabharata, it also very clearly says that they were not relying on the, uh, the rain or the uh, uh, for the crops, they were having irrigation system in place and which was the duty of a king to provide and so also maintained by the people. 
and Hathi Gumpa of Bhuvaneshwar, a Kharavar period around 180, depicts about the canal from Tosali river. I mean, if you look at the canal system was there in 180, that is the evidence we are having. And Mauryan period gave much more importance to agriculture and irrigation systems. Sudarshan Lake started by Pusya Gupta, the governor of Chandragupta and completed by Tusapa, the governor of Asoka, was mentioned in the Indica Megasthenes, the book written by Megasthenes. And Arthasastra provides more importance to irrigation supported by the state and people. In 200 AD, the Sudarshan Lake was constructed by Pusya Gupta, got damaged due to the flood, which was repaired during the reign of Rudradaman I. And during Gupta period, the Sudarshan Lake was constructed during the reign of Skanda Gupta, incurring a huge cost. That means, you know, if you look at this kind of lake and the water bodies, uh, artificial water bodies were also constructed, used and maintained well by the kings and uh, local people as well. In South India, irrigation were carried out using small tanks and lakes during even Iron Age. In South India, organized irrigation system were in work in 100 AD as per the Sangam literary works. Chola king Karikala, who was famous you know, for building, constructing a great dam on the river Kaveri, uh, which exists till today. Of course, that has been changed a lot, but however, it is uh, you know, still being used by the people. And during 700 to 1200 AD, the enormous growth of irrigation facility took place by Pandyas of Madurai, Pallavas of Kanchi, Cholas of Tanjavar, and Hoysala of Karnatak, Chalukyas of Kalani, and Kakatayas of Warangal, using tanks, inundated canal, and channels and wells. So, if you look at there is a great, uh, you know, something around 500 years of history are uh, there who uh, indicates the historical evidence of 500 years um, uh, indicates that uh, irrigation was the prior uh, priority of the you know rulers at uh, the, uh, in the southern india and rashtrakuta of uh, malkhid the, in the gulbarga district of karnataka continued the deccan tradition of irrigation system for rural development most of the irrigation works were initiated and funded by the state but the maintenance part were managed by the village assembly during Pallava periods. You can see also similar things are mentioned in Arthasastra that it will be done, initiated by the king, but however it has to be managed by the local people. There are two systems during particularly uh, Chola's uh, period. One is Eri Bariyam, a committee for maintaining works of irrigation system which consists of six members who will held office for 360 days. Of course, after that there will be change of the guard for the people. And besides this, there is another separate committee which is known as uh, Kalingu Bariyam and uh, which is uh, in English if you look at it, it is a Swiss committee under the village assembly uh, which will be taking care of the closing of the Swiss, maintenance of the Swiss gates and other things for controlling the water supply to the fields and other places. So, therefore, it very clearly indicates that there is a system which plays in southern India for the governance of water bodies as well. Not only the construction, but governance of those bodies and how to control that. And during the time of uh, Bikramaditya 6, that big tank uh, was constructed Katagiri, uh, Badami Taluk in Karnataka for draining of excess water from a tank at a higher level to the tank at the lower levels. And uh, Chalukyans of Kalani had a separate department for execution and maintenance of irrigation works. They were having a separate department like uh, as of today. And Hoysala dynasty which uh, lasted around uh, something 1000 to 1400 AD also took interest in making rain fed tanks and canals channelize river water to the dry lands for cultivations. Uh, Ganapati Deva of Kakata dynasty constructed several irrigation works consisting of 100 tanks rivulets as per the Anamkonda, Nirostia, Kabe inscriptions people got during this period which is 
talked about this irrigation system carried out by this uh, Kakataya dynasty. Pakhl Lake, which is around 80 square miles, is a very huge lake, located 30 miles away from Warangal, lies between Krishna and Munnari river. Ramappa Lake is formed by a ring of hills on three sides, with colossal bun on the northern side. If you look at, uh, they were choosing the natural, you know, places, for example, like uh, hills and other things. And they were also joining the rivulets in such that you can have uh, very uh, easily uh, store the water without much constructional work unlike in the modern system. Well irrigation were also practiced at that time. What do you mean by dam? So if you look at dams are the barriers either natural or artificial to hold the flow of waters. And dams were in existence in India from time immemorial. The artificial water dams were mentioned in Rig Veda as Rodhas, which were having flood gates like Uddha or Dura, that is the term what they use and uh, we can think of using the sluice gate in modern time. So the dam along with the breeze is known as Setu in Sanskrit, Anai in Tamil. And as to the Devi Purana, the Palibandha or the dam provides its measurements to be around 200 cubits for irrigation system. Kunal Jataka, which is around 400 to 500 BC, mentioned dispute between the Sakya and the Kolya tribes for water distribution from dam across the river Hoini. And if you look at today also, we are having dispute among the states like your uh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu about the Kaveri you know, water distribution. Similarly, in future also we will be having because water is going to be very precious things. Therefore, it very much clearly indicates that there is a concern for water and how to save it in ancient India and also that related technology. And the Sudarshan Lake come dam in Kathiwara, which was built around 300 to 457 BC, which is, is very, very large, like uh, around 278 acres, is the uh, earliest known reservoir that serves around 400 years without major repair. Of course, at 150 AD, it got damaged uh, by the flood and was repaired by Rudaman and again burst around 456 AD. This we have already discussed. Let us look at the Grand Anikat Kalanai, which is I had mentioned it was um, basically uh, built on the Kaveri rivers to irrigate the fertile delta region. Uh, of Kaveri and Kalene was constructed uh, with a uncut stone of 329 meter long and 20 meter wide and 5.4 meter high across the mainstream of the Kaveri. If you look at this figure, what I have shown here, it is the modern uh, dam systems in the river Kaveri. It is not the old one because it was already being changed a lot by the Britishers and later on by the government of India. And this Grand Anikat, which is known as Kalanai, was built by Chola King Karikala around 1st century AD. It is one of the oldest water irrigation system in the world, which is still in use. The main function of the Grand Anikat, as I told earlier, was to keep the waters of Kaveri away from the faster or the steeper Koli Dam. I will be showing a picture of Koli Dam in the next slide. During normal times, while allowing the flood waters to be safely transported from the Kaveri, which is at higher elevation, to the sea via the Koli Dam. Koli Dam is a river. So, if you look at, this is the topology of the Kaveri river. This is the Akhand uh, Kaveri and it is it gets bifurcated at this point here. And this river, which is the fast stream, is known as Koli Dam, which goes to the sea. The other portion, which is known as the Kaveri, like is having several branches here, and this is the delta region. And this is the Grand Anikat, which was built by the Chola king Kalikala. And uh, this is a, uh, you know, is a very important because this is at a higher elevation. It will be water will be flowing through this. Uh, what you call uh, wares to the fast moving Koli Dam uh, river. 
And as I told earlier, Kalanai was built to harness the water of river Kaveri in times of drought. Right? It will be water will be there in the Kaveri. But during the flood or the water excess, what will happen? This will excess water will be uh, moving from this Kaveri river to the Koli Dam. And thus the avoiding uh, the devastation caused due to the flood. Ancient engineers of Bharat had created irrigation system with innumerable small reservoirs with networks of irrigation channels which I will be discussing little later on. And the area irrigated uh, by ancient irrigation network is uh, around 69,000 acres. But by the early 20th century, the irrigation land had been increased to about 1 million acres. As I told earlier, this is the river Colidum and this is the river Kaveri. Of course, bifurcation is somewhere upstream which is not shown in this figure. And today the modern time is these are the you know all places were being placed but earlier time it was a dam or what you call the dam was earlier in this region. And nowadays people call entire region as the Grand Anicut. But let me tell you that when the Britishers came in to repair this dam which was not being used for years together due to the war and other things and then they found it was quite difficult. According to one of the British engineer, Baird Smith in 1856, he has given some evidence uh, writings. He says that for nearly 25 years from the time at which Captain Caldwell's work were completed around 1806, incessant struggle was maintained against increasing tendency of the river bed to silt up. They were finding the problems of silting up. And then in the process what happened they try they could not understand what is the design. And they made some construction like increasing the height of the dam and they uh, landed in problems and these are the problems which are described in this statement. The head and the many parts of the channel were periodically cleared of deposit by manual labor. Long expensive embankments were carried across the bed of the mainstream. So as to the force largest supply of water into Cavalry branch. They were not doing, so they started doing all these things and that has spoiled everything. All these efforts however were ineffectual and the bed continued to rise, supply to diminish, the extent of land under irrigation yearly decreased and they were getting also revenue from that because they are supplying water to the farmers. The revenue was falling off and the condition of people were visibly becoming worse and worse. About 1829-30 the crisis had been reached. So, you know, they struggled for 25 years, they could not really solve the problems because they were not knowing what was the design. So, um, let me just uh, show you how it looks and what are the things, how design it is to give you some uh, this thing ideas. This work, uh, this uh, diagrams and other thing, uh, ideas also taken from the paper that is tanks and anicuts of South India, examples of an alternate science of engineering by Chitra Krishnan and Srinivasa V. Biravalli. And uh, if you look at uh, these are the machinery which is the actual dam uh, made out of stones and the shape if you look at it is a wavy shape. And these are the earthen buns which we are having and uh, this also uh, if you look at eastern side this eastern this northern side western side there is also a bun which uh, is a very important for the maintaining this thing and there was a war. Uh, between the two local kings and they were at logger ahead at that time. They did not allow for it to maintain. That is why Britisher came into picture and then they mediate and then do that. So, if you look at uh, the Kaveri, this is the side view of this, you know like Kaveri was having a higher altitude than the Kali Dam. The water has to come from here to there, this side view. And there is another interesting feature of this is that this elevation if you look at there is a slope right it has a transverse slope descent from the front of the rear side which makes in some parts irregular and smooth slopes in other irregularly by 3 to 4 steps and there is something 1 feet 4 inches kind of difference are there. And people do not understand why it is so, what for it is and what they did they raise these heights you know they raise these heights of this machinery work or the stone work and then they 
thought that they will uh, you know solve the problem and they uh, the problem was uh, what to call host as i told earlier these uh, features what you call uh, making this th uh, two or three waves from one and other there is a wavy structures actually uh, its crest was not labeled but sloping higher at the western end than the eastern end that i had shown you like uh, one feet four inch kind of things and it had transfer slope too and a descent from the front to rear which makes in some part of regular and smooth slope in other parts regular by 3 to 4 steps probably near to be replaced every 5 years because this maintenance was not being done at that time and this is a very complicated structure and why it was so that the britisher could understand but now people are saying it might be due to you know like uh, it will be creating secondary flows which will making this seal to be not settled down but suspended in the water and that need to be research and as i had told you earlier this overall spread of about 3 4 inch thick of very fine and smooth chunam to prevent the water from making the smallest impressions was uh, need of the hour i am like that might be the reason and this plaster probably needed to be replaced every 5 years as i had uh, told you earlier this grand anchor's curved form and the transverse longitudinal slopes of its crest transported significant fraction of bed sediments over the anchor during the floods that was the design what people are anticipating okay it might be and it may be because if the flow is there there will be secondary flows if the secondary flow is there that means recirculation will be there and that will make the seal to be suspended and it will be carried over from the a uh, cavity to the colidum in fact the first modification done in 1806 ad around by british engineer was made to label the top of the structure raise it by about 2 feet and they were not understand they said okay let us raise the way and which created problems of seal deposition and thus you know then they couldn't find out there what they did the overall bed slope from the point of bifurcation cavity branch is increased thereby increasing the speed of flow hence it sediments carrying the capacity and preventing any net aggradation aggradation means basically the rise of river bed due to the deposition of sand they have done but that is not working degradation is refers to picking up the sediments from the river earlier it was doing the degradation is picking the silt and taking away now that was the design what uh, we are having let me tell you that what uh, this grand um, what you call cotton later on cotton gave a statement he says that uh, this statement i had earlier mentioned let me mention again it was from them the native indians we learned how to secure a foundation in the loose sand of unmeasured depth in fact what we learned from them made the difference between financial success and failure for the madras river irrigation executed by our engineers have been from the first the greatest financial success of any engineering works in the world solely because we learned from them them means native indians with this lesson about the foundation we built bridges wells aqueducts and every kind of hydraulic work we are thus deeply indebted to the native engineers so uh, if you look at this is the things what will be i'll just summarize this that this is if you look at the anicut facilitates the water during the drought and flood water transport to the colidum along with the silt without silt depositions right and the sideways slope silt transport to the colidum during the flood and uh, if you look at that means there the if you summarize it the traditional automatic drip silting which is very important and which can, we can learn from them and utilize in the modern systems and drought water balance and wear hydraulics is also very sophisticated and which need to be looked at thank you very much for looking at this uh, lectures and we'll stop over here and in the next lecture we'll be discussing about uh, different aspects of the irrigation system thank you